Doctor, we will have Prof. Asad Zaman. But before, let me read her his profile first. So, Professor Dr. Asad Zaman, pursued his Bachelor of Science in Mathematics from MIT in 1974, and also he pursued uh, Master of Master of Science, uh, Master of MS Statistics in 1976, and also finished his PhD in Economics in 19. 78 from Stanford University, and he has taught economics and econometrics at leading universities like Columbia University, Pennsylvania, John Hopkins, Caltech, and Brooklyn University, and also Ankara. And he is perheading an attempt to launch a unique Islamic educational process within the umbrella of Ahwat University which provides life skills required to practice Islam in modern societies. Uh, Professor Asad also engaged in projects for decolonizing the social sciences and rebuilding human knowledge on Islamic epistemological foundations. He has been the vice chancellor of PIDE in Pakistan, a member of the Monetary Policy Committee of SBP and Pakistan Board of Statistics. He has textbooks, statistical foundations of econometric economy, techniques, which published by Academic Press, New York, 1996, and is widely used as a reference in advanced graduate courses. And he is also a managing editor of International Econometric Review and on the book of editors of many international journals. His research on Islamic economics is widely cited and has been highly influential in shaping the field. His publications in top ranked journals like Annals of Statistics, Journal of Econometrics, Economic Econometric Theory, Journal of Labor Economic, and etc., have nearly 3,000 citations as per Google Scholar. Okay, so Prof. Asad, Prof. Asad. Zaman, uh, you have to Prof. You have 20 minutes. Online people can hear me. Can you hear me? Well, yeah, we can hear you, Prof. Yeah, yes, sir. Sir. we can hear you. Yes. Should we start? Uh, am I? Is it? Should I start? Yeah, but a little bit in um, sound. Okay, for Prof. Asad Zaman, please, you have 20 minutes. Uh, the time is yours, Prof. So, Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Uh, everything depends on intentions, the worth of actions, and we are here to seek knowledge. This is one of the highest forms of worship. But to make this an act of worship, we have to correct our intentions, to make sure that we intend to use this knowledge for the benefit of mankind. So this talk is about um, how we can use Islamic principles for uh, local empowerment and for environmental stewardship. Uh, there is an Islamic distinction between useful knowledge and useless knowledge. The useless knowledge is just random facts about the world uh, which we cannot put into practice. Uh, 
but the critical criteria for useful knowledge in Islam is that it should enter our hearts and it should lead to action. So this puts a heavy responsibility on me as a speaker to make sure to provide useful knowledge, which leads to action. And uh, when I was studying, most of the knowledge that I acquired was of a theoretical nature, which could not be put into practice. And this is actually part of the Western intellectual tradition. I think therefore I am means that uh, just having thoughts is enough. Uh, but actually, the in Islamic um, theory, epistemology, our heart is the driver of action, not the mind. And so the first thing we need to do is tazkiyah, to purify our hearts. In that case, the, our hearts will drive us to good actions. And if the hearts are corrupt, then they will lead us to bad actions, which have bad consequences. So the climate crisis is due to bad human actions. And it can be corrected by good actions. But how do we do good actions? For that, we have to purify the hearts. And then we have to acquire useful knowledge. Uh, useful knowledge will uh, and uh, a clean heart will lead us to good actions, which can be used to uh, correct the problems that we see. Now, when it comes to action, there are three levels of action. Individual level, personal level, our hearts, minds, souls, and nafs. At the community level, which is our neighborhood. And at the level of the ummah, which is like one body. If one part feels pain, then all parts feel pain. So we start with individual action. Our actions are driven by our desires. And if our hearts are corrupt, we will desire the wrong things. And if we purify our hearts, then our hearts will want the right things. Now, the thing is that there are many pathways to God. This doesn't mean that there are many truths. It's just that the truth is one, but we are standing in different places. So the path we need to take to get to the truth differs for each person. And this is an important illustration of a very important principle which is often ignored. When we are trying to change things, you must start from where you are. So if I am standing in a university and I am a professor, I have a different path. If I'm a student, I have a different path. And if I'm in the government, then the path for me is different. Everyone has his, has his own role to play. Uh, but to recognize what my path is, I have to do tazkiyah because tazkiyah will open my heart to the understanding of what Allah Ta'ala wants from me. So one of the critical things for um, tazkiyah involves many dimensions, but the economic dimension is to reduce our attachment to worldly possessions. This is the highest level uh, that we spend the things we love most dearly. But if we cannot start there, and most people cannot start at that point, then you just spend a thing which you love a little bit less. You have to do things which you can do, not things which are so difficult that you cannot do them. And why does this matter? Because the crisis that we are facing is caused by a process which started with the Industrial Revolution, which led to massive overproduction far above our needs. Overproduction leads to excess consumption because to, uh, to consume the goods that are excess, you have to have excess consumption. And how is this done? This is done by an education which develops our taste for luxurious lifestyles. Islam prohibits israf and tabzir and uh, teaches us simple lifestyles. So if we want to get to a sustainable pathway for mankind, we have to lead simple lifestyles, uh, avoid excess production, excess uh, consumption, excess labor. 
this is uh, the sustainable development language which doesn't occur in our deen is actually a wrong way of thinking about the problem because what happened in the industrial revolution is that people uh, started uh, wanting more things to get more things you have to labor more and earn more money the process of laboring more also leads to excess production so it's a vicious cycle everything is uh, you produce more you consume more you labor more and you are just trapped in the cycles of of consuming producing and laboring and this depletes the planet of resources so sustainable development is the wrong solution because it says how can we slow this down so that um the planet can survive the point is not to slow this down the point is to get off get outside and uh, stop doing this completely so how can we do this we have to step out of this uh, process which is turning us into human resources uh, uh the western education creates human resources not human beings what are human resources they are interchangeable parts for use in the production process so to counter that we have to realize the wisdom of the quran which says that one human life is worth the whole of humanity every moment of our life is precious it is not a commodity for sale on the market once you realize that once you recognize that our life is uh, is is infinitely precious you will never be a human resource so to um understand how we got into this place how did capitalism emerge and how it has trapped us uh we have to look very briefly there there are many papers of mine which explain this much more deeply but there were religious wars for centuries in europe and so europeans said that let's get rid of this religion it just leads to wars and so they built a secular society where religion was excluded uh that led to rejection of god life after death judgment and once you reject that then man is only an animal and he is uh, animals are driven by their desires and the society is just a jungle so capitalism is built on individualism i only worry about myself hedonism pursuit of pleasure on this dunya competition life is a is as a is a survival of the fittest and greed i want to just get as much as i can Uh, Islamic societies are built on the opposite principles of social responsibility, taking care of each other. Instead of success, uh, instead of pleasure in this dunya, we want success in the akhirah. We want to cooperate with each other, and uh, we are we have generosity. So these are four opposite principles. So how can we take action on our individual level to make progress? We have to understand that capitalism is built on the nafsi ammara. the desires and allah taala this is required for capitalism because excess consumption can only be sustained if we just pursue our idle desires allah taala forbids us to do this and says that uh, we should not pursue our desires so as a practical strategy what we can do uh, in order to change ourselves because everyone is shaped by the environment and we are living in an environment which trains us to desire luxuries and higher standards of living uh, higher incomes so uh, we can't start uh, by revolution we have to take small steps which we can do so i counsel that we should give up one thing that we are doing uh, in obedience to our desires and replace it by doing one thing in obedience to allah and make that thing small enough that you can do it but not so small that it doesn't matter take one small step towards allah and allah taala will uh, if you walk towards allah allah taala will come running towards you so this is the hadith to that effect so the second stage is collective action how can what we can we do as a community now uh, notice that this doesn't e- exist in western economics western economics you have individualism microeconomics is about one person but in islamic microeconomics is about the local community you don't consider the individual as the smallest unit of society so uh, we should focus on building our neighborhood communities 
there are so many rights of neighbors that uh, that uh, it was reported that uh, Jibril kept advising me until I thought he would make me make them heirs. So all of this is about building the community. The today the form of the masjid remains. We all go there and pray, but the community concept has gone. Actually, the nucleus for change in Islamic societies is the masjid community, and that we need to rebuild. So, because the, when you get together five times, then you have to think about the mahalla, and you think about the people in the mahalla, and the needs of the mahalla, and the needs of society, and build social relationships. So, I have an idea that we should need to start by building uh, these khidmatul uh, jama'a organizations where uh, people who get together at the, uh, at the masjid uh, work together to think about the needs of the people in that community and to try to solve them. And the basic principle should be self-help and self-reliance. Also, we should adopt simpler lifestyles, encourage each other to do so, and work towards uh, improving the environment uh, take care of our garbage, uh, build our relationships with our neighbors and, and with God. Uh, the most important principle for uh, change is what we tend not to do. We tend to think about the problems of the globe or the problems of the nation or the problems of the ummah. Start with me and you. Start very small because even the Masjid Jama'ah is uh, small is uh, maybe too difficult it's hard to get people together to work together on collective action so if you can't even get the masjid to act then just uh, take a small group of like-minded people find one or two or three other people in your mahalla and start start to do things for the mahalla once you start doing service then uh, people will um, join you. So start cleaning the mahalla, start asking neighbors to uh, make sure that the recycling takes place and so on. <clears throat> One very important principle for social change is that we should concentrate on the process. Today, you see, we are all trapped in outcome-oriented thinking. What will happen one year from now as a result of my actions? But Islam doesn't teach us that. If, if you are planting a, a, a plant and the qayama, you see the signs of qayama, you should continue planting. It is the act of planting which matters. So <clears throat> today, <clears throat> as we are sitting in this lecture, if, we, if our hearts are moved and if we make the plan to implement, we have already succeeded. Because success doesn't lie in the future. What will happen as a result of our actions? Success lies in obeying Allah in this moment. So the, the biggest problem uh, in the Islamic world is that we are uh, waiting. We are waiting for the Mahdi to come. We are waiting for the governments to take action. We are waiting for somebody else to solve the problems. Uh, there is nobody else. Uh, look at the problems that you can solve and solve them. And if you are... In, take the act to solve them, you have already succeeded because you're, you don't have to wait for the outcomes. So the Munazzamatul Khidmatul Jama'a is a key uh, driver for change because it's a natural uh, organization which already exists. Uh, there are many ways to organize and this should be creatively adapted to the conditions that you are uh, found it. If you have a united masjid community, many, many pathways open up for creating change in your neighborhood. Uh, your community can apply for interest-free loans to the nearest uh, Islamic finance. You can develop community business pr pr projects, green projects, infrastructure, etc., etc. Once you have an organization, uh, it can take actions. And the great thing about this uh, uh, Masjid Jama'a is that it already exists. The infrastructure, most uh, masajid have committees, they have finance committees and they meet. 
So we just have to expand their agenda. Instead of thinking about the masjid, they should start thinking about the neighborhood. There are also uh, bigger uh, things that one can do. There are local currency systems you can uh, arrange. Uh, we can, uh, if once you have a community, you can arrange for uh, uh, the insurance with the local uh, hospitals. You can create local credit unions. You can create a local currency which encourages people to buy in local businesses. So today, today we have adversarial relationships with our own uh, neighborhood stores. Uh, we say that, okay, they are trying to overcharge us and so on. We have to think of them, our neighbors who are running businesses, as part of our community. I mean, we have to help them survive and we have to help them prosper. And this cooperative mindset is the opposite of the competitive mindset which is created by capitalism. I don't know what happened. So now this went back to. All right, so I'm sorry, I messed up the slides. Uh, so um, we often think about government as an enabler. Uh, but I think that we have to think of the government as the enemy. <clears throat> if the collective governments of the Islamic world could not even raise a voice for Palestine, then we have to understand whose side they are on. And so instead of worrying about uh, getting the government to help these projects, we have to see how we can bypass the government. The nation states were set up to divide the Islamic world as a part of a divide and rule strategy. And this has been working very effectively to keep us separated. So uh, this is again a, a general principle. Sometimes you can find some governments which are partly helpful. And so you should do what you can with what you have. But in general, we should not rely on governments to be uh, helping us. So when we take collective action, we have to think beyond the government to the ummah. So basically in Islamic economics, microeconomics is based on the community and macroeconomics is based on the ummah. It's not individuals and nations. So uh, collective action... Uh, one basic principle is that the larger the group, the more effective it is, as long as you have uh, a cohesion and identity. Nation states emerged in Europe as an imagined community. There was no real community. It was something in the imagination of the people. But this imagination was so powerful that these uh, communities were able to overcome city-states and establish their domination around the globe. The Ummah is a very, very powerful concept. It has to, it is also an imagined community. It's, it's we imagine that we are together, but this imagination is very strong and powerful because it is enabled and empowered by the Quran. Allah Ta'ala addresses us as the community. This means that the community, the Ummah exists in the idea of God and that is the most powerful existence. Many people say Ummah doesn't exist, but if Allah Ta'ala says, talks about the Ummah, then it exists and it is, has been created for the welfare of mankind. So unlike the nation community, which divides people and leads to wars, the Ummah community is for the benefit of all of humanity. So it doesn't divide us, it unites us. So learning from experience, we should realize that there's not much hope from nation states. And if we rely on the idea that first let us capture the nation state, then we will do something else, we will never get there. So we have to go around, bypass the national state. So uh, the community is the basic unit of action and we can link these communities locally. Uh, one uh, effective pairing would be to link rural communities with urban communities. Urban communities provide manufacturers. 
while the rural communities provide food <clears throat> and uh, this would be a win-win solution today with the electronics we can link communities around the globe as well and we can create um, exchange boards sort of like uber etc where electronically communities can uh, communicate with each other and fulfill each other's needs there are things known as community cooperative credit organizations where if some community has excess they can give that to other communities in need and uh, do this on a mutual sharing basis on the basis of the uh, idea of the community as one body uh, information is the key and now that is readily available May, being available being aware of the communities around us and being able to communicate what we have in surplus and what they have in needs uh, that is the key and that's now easy to do <clears throat> there is another way also to conceive of islamic banks today actually islamic banks have become part of the capitalist banking structure and uh, these banks are um, creating money but for the wrong purposes to enable luxurious consumption and to enable gambling and investment uh, there are many problems that have been recognized and the proposal has been made to shift money creation to state because the private money creation done by banks has done a lot of harm to the government and uh, to the humanity and uh, nearly 300 or more banking crises have occurred over the past few decades because of the actions of bank. So <clears throat> instead, of, um, instead of the commercial capitalist bank, we need to change the thinking at the banks. Uh, instead of creating money for private profits, let the bank create money for public service. Uh, this, instead of changing from profit maximization, we should move to service maximization. Uh, doing this would lead to many ways of uh, thinking, many aspects which are not, uh, which are which which are uh, not thought of by private uh, banks looking about, about profits. So <clears throat> today, uh, credit creation is done by state banks, and uh, the crypto coin has shown that. That's not the only way. There are other ways. And there is a third way, uh, which was done in the Islamic uh, era. And that was by uh, trust. And trust was built on communities. So this is a bottom-up method to create money. And uh, this method worked to create trade between um, Al-Andalus and China. So it was very powerful. But this method has been lost and it needs to be recreated. If we can recreate this, we can create a global currency, which is an important requirement of this time. <clears throat> so the question is, is this just an idle dream which can never be realized? Uh, no, actually, as I said, you have to start from where you are. So there are some pragmatic steps we can take to create what we call disruptive inno innovations. Start with a small bank. If you, can't, if you can persuade a small bank to change and start with a dual bottom line. Say that, okay, you don't shift over to service. Uh, keep your profit, but also uh, give us a second bottom line. What you're doing for the community, for the ummah. If you're not doing anything for the ummah, then you don't deserve the name of Islamic bank. <clears throat> so with these uh, suggestions, uh, I'm going to end with the dua, oh Allah grant us the knowledge that benefits hearts that are pure and actions that lead to your pleasure. Help us to act upon the knowledge that you have given us and guide us to serve your creation for the sake of your love. Protect us from useless theoretical knowledge and purify our hearts so that we may walk on the path of truth. Allah, inna ka antal halim al hakim. سبحان الله بحمده سبحان الله الحزيم برحمتك يا رحمة الرحمين
of a settlement for a, comp a comprehensive materials about how Islamic principles for local environment and environmental stewardship. If I could read some or sum up the uh, to act of what are currently happened, with, whether it is nationally or globally, it is uh, it starts from where you are. I mean, uh, start from the principles that we have uh, to act, whether it is acting on individually or uh, uh, act together or collective action. Jadi uh, uh, saya juga akan sub up di bahasa Indonesia ya Bapak Ibu. Jadi bahasan sebelum ke Q&A, bahasan uh, dari Prof. Asa tadi ba bagaimana sih sebelum kita mengetahui bahwa permasalahan yang ada ini kan uh, porosnya itu kan ada di diri kita ya. Jadi tadi ya ba bagaimana Prof. Asa zaman itu menekankan Uh, kita itu sekarang ada di mana peran kita apa itu yang dimaksimalkan dan tadi untuk tidak berlebih-lebihan ya uh, tafs uh, tafsir gitu ya yang mana tadi bisa di prinsip-prinsip uh, yang bisa dilakukan itu uh, apa namanya melakukan apa yang sesuai syariah terus kemudian uh, start from where we are gitu ya dimulai dari mana kita terus uh, mulai untuk collective action melalui komunitas gitu ya dan juga bagaimana pemerintah itu sebagai enabler, uh, enabler ya uh, untuk hal-hal uh, yang ada untuk Islamic economics gitu. Oke. Okay. Uh, and then for uh, Profesor Kabir Hasan also uh, if I could sum up in uh, Indonesian language uh, tadi Prof uh, Kabir Hasan itu membahas bagaimana sih peluang Islamic uh, finance uh, untuk sustainable development yang mana Tadi banyak option ya terkait uh, green, bagaimana investasi di green sukuk, terus kemudian public uh, private partnership, kolaborasi itu ya intinya uh, untuk ke arah ke sustainable development gitu. Dan ada beberapa poin SDGs yang tadi sesuai dengan makosis syariah. Oke, okay. so uh, sorry because I have to explain as well in Indonesia for the audience. Uh, so let's continue to the Q&A session. Uh, so we will have a Q&A session, but only one question for the on-site uh, or offline uh, offline site or on-site, and one question from uh, the virtual meeting. Is there? Uh, I would like to invite first from the on-site first. Is there anyone who want to ask a question? Please raise your hand. Okay, so because uh, the guy who heard uh, Bapak yang pakai baju hitam ya, uh, please. Okay. Okay, please introduce yourself first, Pak. Baik, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alright, uh, for the moderator, I wanna say thank you so much for the chance. And then I wanna uh, let me introduce myself before I'm Henry Herdiana. And actually, I'm a student of Syariah Economic Department, uh, Siluang University. Uh, actually, I wanna ask uh, one question for Professor Kabira Hasan, but it's okay if the question uh, will be answered by Asad Jaman. Uh, so for the question is, Professor Kabira Hasan said that SDGs or Sustainable Development Goals increase from year to year, but for the reality, say that Indonesia is still lagging for behind in forcing SDGs targets. And then, even though Indonesia has implemented Islamic finance, so the question is, what is contribute for Islamic finance to SDGs or uh, Sustainable Development Goals? Thank you. Pardon, sorry, for what, what kind of actions? What is contribute from Islamic finance to Sustainable Development Goals? Okay, okay um, thank you for the question, Mr. Henry. Yes. Henry. Okay, thank you. And then, 
I will go to, uh, let's try to answer first. Yeah, Prof. Tabir. Okay, uh, Henry. The question uh, from Mr. Henry is, uh, which is, it, oh, it, it, it is actually has been explained, yeah. Uh, what is the role of Islamic finance in is, as uh, sustainable development goals? Yeah. For Prof. Well, uh, uh, I have, Hassan, uh, this uh, I have... answer as, and because as we know that Indonesia is still lacking in uh, fulfilling the SDGs goals. Okay, you for, know, uh, for Prof. Uh, Tabir. Uh, it, this yes. Uh, answer for the question. Yes, uh, um, Henry. Thank you for your question. Um, actually, I explained that uh, yeah. in my presentation. But Indonesia is the largest Islamic country in the world in the Muslim population. Um, it is still lagging behind uh, in terms of implementing Islamic way of doing business. Islamic financial instrument, so on. But it is a pioneer in many ways. It came up with, you know, sustainability sukuk, green sukuk. Now, again, uh, to echo with Professor Asad Zaman, uh, there are different ways of trying to think, solve a problem. So there are, if you study Islamic economics, in the last reading I have, there are seven different ways of looking at this thing. So what I believe in, you know, whatever you have acquired from history, thousands of years, this is a common civilization heritage. So what we have learned, because even during the Prophet Sallallahu some of the instruments that we use, Madarawa and other types, so it existed even before Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu came to existence. So he changed the structure of it. If there's something un-Islamic, he changed it. One of these things that I face or see in many Muslim countries, the product development has been very slow. Even if the product is developed, it's like hotwa shopping, you know, trying to mimic the conventional financial product. So we have to have the skill set and the knowledge of Islam and also the mindset. We're talking about the heart uh, that we have to brought together in order to come up with Islamic finance instruments to solve the climate problem and all sorts of problems. Mahmoud Yunus talks about three zeros, zero hunger, zero poverty, zero unemployment. So this is his new slogan right now. He is now the interim prime minister of Bangladesh after Sheikh Hasina was toppled. But if you look at, go deeper and the understanding of Islamic economics, Islamic finance is a small part of it. You'll find SDG goals and everything. Actually, this is already in Islamic thinking, Islamic ecosystem. It's already said in the Quran. It's already said in the teaching of the Prophet Sallallahu So we really do not need to borrow ideas from the West. As Professor Zaman said, I agree with him. We need to go back and look at ourselves, look at our own history and tradition. And there are wealth of knowledge, useful knowledge that we can use. The only part that I'm talking about, this is, you know, study was that the gap is not really insurmountable. I did a small study in the context of Bangladesh. There's 180 million people. And I actually simply collect zakat and usher the right way. We can eradicate poverty from Bangladesh in the next 10 years. But the question is, you will never see the concept of Islamic social finance, zakat, sadaqa, kordul hassan, for example, except Akwat in Pakistan in our national developmental goals, we never use it. Right now we are in transition in Bangladesh, that many people say it's a revolution. But if you look at the new government, does not have a total Islamic character, even though whole revolution was brought in by Islamic-minded people. So always a revolution is hijacked by the people, those who are not totally Islamic oriented. So we need to be a good Muslim. We need to understand our Akidah and the Quran and Sunnah. We have to combine this Islamic knowledge with modern knowledge if we really want to win the world and want to make a change. It's not only SDG in every sphere of our life. So I'll stop here and let Brother Professor Asad Zaman say something. Okay, thank you. Is it answering your question, uh, Prof. Uh, Mr. Henry? So. Uh, Prof. Kabir likes that uh, start where I, I mean we have to expand our skill set yeah because 
it will affect to the uh, uh, sustainable development and or uh, any other things other than sustainable development. Okay, thank you. And the next question, I will choose one question from a uh, Zoom chat meeting, uh, which is the question is from Mr. Lukman. The questions. Okay, is I can read the question so we can. Oh, uh, the first I question hope that is, everybody else can. Oh, actually, maybe you should read it out. It's not Sorry. always based on wealth maximization, especially for Muslims. Do you agree? And the second question theories of Islamic collective action can be accommodated by the social choice framework and also the works of Eleanor Ostrom, which are both acknowledged in conventional economics. What problems do you see in these ideas? Okay, right, so, so for, for Asad Zaman. Yes. I think that's the greatest to problem. The question today. From, uh, Mr. Lukman. I think the greatest problem that the Muslim Ummah is facing today is that we are looking to the West for guidance instead of the Quran. So uh, there are, we have our own theories of collective action which were put into practice by Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when the people um, from uh, the Muhajireen from Mecca came into Medina, he created the Mawakhat Brotherhood. Now, this was a very powerful and ingenious strategy. You had this collection of people who are uprooted from their homes. They have no source of income and they have nothing, no possessions. So he just linked one with one and that enabled them, <clears throat> that gave them a base. And uh, it does an economic action as well as a social action and also integrated the communities. So <clears throat> uh, this is nowhere mentioned in Eleanor Ostrom that this is a possibility. But so basically the idea that we are responsible for 40 neighbors to the right and 40 neighbors to the right and there's a masjid community. Uh, this is not part of exactly as Brother Kabir Hassan said, uh, the World Bank has many schemes for poverty alleviation, but no mention of zakat. So we have our own instruments, but we are not thinking about them. We are looking for guidance from the West. The West does not have our heritage. Uh, similarly, for utility maximization, we have it's 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 a, it's a Western idea. Why should we entertain it? Look to your own intel, uh, intellectual heritage. And uh, one of the biggest problems with this uh, Western epistemology is that it focuses on the wrong, wrong level. <clears throat> See, in Western society, in a secular society, every individual is allowed to have their own religion. And so uh, individualism is a very strong philosophy and it keeps increasing. You do your thing, I do my thing. The only possibility for collective action exists at the national level. If we want to do uh, collective action, then the government has to do it because there is no community. So uh, there is a lot of literature on how communities have broken down on the West and how this has caused much damage. So for us, the natural place for action, you see what we are trying to do, we are trying to create social change. We don't like the way the things are going and we shouldn't. So how can we change things? Well, maybe we can wait for the government. Maybe we can apply a theory developed by Western experts. Or maybe we look into our own heritage and do what we can with what we have in the present moment. This is what I'm saying that instead of uh, finding fancy theories and uh, trying to do things which will have effects 10 years from now. Do something now, today, with what you have and with what, what is in hand and what is available. So it's actually, I think, one of the biggest disablers and uh, it causes paralysis that we say, okay, we can't do anything until X, Y, Z occurs or um, focusing on what uh, the government should do and what uh, the minister should do and what uh, other people should do. Uh, we are always thinking about what other people can do. 
and uh, very little thinking about what I can do for climate change. So this is the thing that if I work on uh, protecting the earth, which is given to us as an aman from Allah for the sake of the love of Allah, as I'm walking to the masjid, I, I clean the path. This is uh, one of the branches of Iman. So that uh, if we aim at the right level, we will get things done. If we aim at the wrong level, nothing will get done. I think that's enough from my part. Okay, thank you, Prof. Asa. Any other questions? So, actually, I'm has comprehensively uh, thought everything yeah, by, by Quran and Sunnah. And it depends on us. Uh, we can start where you are, uh, what I can get from Prof. Asad Zaman's points. Yeah. Okay, thank you for Prof. Uh, Asad Zaman and Prof. Kab Hassan for the online session. Uh, would uh, do you uh, would you like to have any final thoughts from both of you from Prof Kabir Hassan and from Prof Asad Zaman? Uh, to time well, difference. it's uh, it's very late in New Orleans, uh, and uh, Hurricane Francine is going Prof on our way. And Prof Asad Zaman for, uh, for Prof Kabir. Yes, I want to thank all of you and wish you all the best and and yeah, uh, listen what. Thought? What uh, Professor um, Asad Zaman said, we really need to look inside instead of outside. I have been, you know, really doing um, heavy advocacy work for the last 20, 30 years in Bangladesh, you know, try to have the Islamic concept and national development planning like zakat, you know, zakat and taxation to do something. And it really helps in, uh, to increase, you know, the conventional tax as well as the zakat collection, but nobody really. I mean, uh, I do not know why. And of course, I know why, but I think the one of the main reason is that the lack of knowledge that we have. It's not that people are not um, interested, but you know, to have this upbringing, you know, with this Islamic knowledge imbued with uh, Western knowledge, like. You know, if you look at Brother Asad Zaman, he was trained in the top universities in the world. He was, you know, he also taught in the top, best university in the world. He's going back and he's doing some really, I'm very fond of his work, going back to our roots. But the question is how to make it a mainstream, scale it up. This is the problem. That's what I refer to reforming our education system where we can bring the Islamic knowledge and skill set together. Right now, those who are working us, they do not care about skill set. Those who have skill set want to be investment banker, do not care about um, Islamic knowledge. So yes, you know, we, are, we have become ritualistic Muslim. We need to really become a total Muslim, not only ritual. We are confined with the ritual. Of course, we go to the massage and it's, it's, it's mandatory we have to do that. But that's why we think that Islam ends. If you come to the United States, first thing they look is a masajid, and second thing they look for halal. They think that a masajid and halal chicken is anti-Islam. Yes, there are a lot more things that we really need to get out of mindset, and we need to use, uh, we need to um, transform our universities into a true reservoir of Islamic knowledge and train our future generation so that everybody can benefit from Islamic knowledge because Allah has given Quran as a, as a guidance to the whole mankind. It's not only for the Muslim. Allah has given our Rasul to us. If we do not follow, and the world is going to steal us from us. And we are very good in preaching, but not in practicing. We really need to practice. Thank you. Stop here. Okay, thank you, Prof. Kabir Hassan. Please give uh, applause for, for, for Prof. Kabir. And for Prof. Asad Zaman, do you have any final thoughts that yes, you will deliver to say us? Uh, a few words? Yeah, basically, uh, basically, one thing that Muslims don't realize is that social science is the lessons learned by the West about how to build a secular society. Social science was developed after the rejection of Christianity in Europe. 
so it is all about how you can build a secular society without religion so we can't take really accept anything from that uh the we need we have our own social science and that is the fiqh of islam it teaches us how we should behave towards each other what should the structure of laws be etc etc so today we are uh, the islamic societies all over the world are building uh, are trying to build on a secular theory of society developed in europe which is not adapted to islamic societies so what we need to do is to recognize that social science is not a science this is the great deception the word science you see deceives us we think that like physical science you see they have built the atom bomb and they have sent a rocket ship to the moon so obviously it's very powerful so we think that social science is also like that this is not true the social science is just a set of ideas about how we build a secular society today there is a hadith that you will follow my umma will follow the ways of the christians and the jews so today our government is like is built on patterned on the west our educational systems our uh, judiciaries our uh, mm, societies our economic systems everything is patterned on west and not on islamic patterns so we are building uh, trying to build a secular society and we are uh, <clears throat> using some patchwork to make it islamic it doesn't work like that we have to rebuild the entire theory of social science on the foundations of fiqh and then we have to rebuild our societies according to this theory and this is a very huge task but the point is that we don't need to accomplish the goal uh it is said in the hadith that if you start on something you will be raised so if if a person who doesn't know any arabic he decides to learn the alphabet alphabet alif ba and um, then um, he is, has the intention to become a hafiz and death comes to him he will be raised as a hafiz because his intention he only started alif ba but he his intention was to uh, memorize the quran so he will be raised as a hafiz similarly we make the intention to build a uh, islamic society and we do the little things we we just go and feed our neighbor make sure that the neighbor is not hungry we try to create a uh, communal feeling in the neighborhood we try to take care of the responsibilities we try to make sure that the earth is treated as a trust we try to remove the garbage we try to recycle all these things are amana so this is the um, this is these are the final words that i would like to say do what you can with what you have today in islam success does not lie in outcomes what will happen 10 years from now success we can achieve today by following the orders of allah today and if we fail to follow the orders of allah today we have failed today so it's moment to moment it's not uh ones in 50 years from now so i think that's enough thank you okay, thank you very much for Pro for hasan uh, professor asad zaman and professor kabir hasan for a uh, comprehensive and wonderful um material